Your Highness, <coughs> Your Excellencies, distinguished guests. It's a great uh, pleasure, first of all, but a great privilege for me to be able to participate and for the World Intellectual Property Organization to be able to participate uh, in this extremely impressive and dynamic uh, government, world government uh, summit. I thank you, Your Highness. I thank uh, all the ministers uh, and the organizers for this invitation. Uh, and it is a great example of the dynamism and the creativity that characterizes the United Arab Emirates. Well, intellectual property is, of course, a subject that uh, has a certain amount of mystery uh, surrounding it. But essentially, of course, it is simply a set of policies uh, designed to encourage innovation and creativity through the establishment of property rights in certain classes of information and technology. Now, it has actually very old origins, uh, uh, ancient origins, in fact, uh, but it has received sustained business and policy attention, in particular, in recent years. Uh, and that sustained business and policy attention comes from the fact that, of course, technology is a dominant force in our economies and in our societies these days, and intellectual property <coughs> confers on those who develop technology and innovation uh, a protection for the competitive advantage that is conferred by the new technology and the uh, new innovation. <clears throat> uh, what we have seen in recent years is very much a, an upsurge in the demand for intellectual property rights as a consequence of the centrality of technology in our economy. So if we take the year 2017, for example, there were some 3.2 million patent applications filed around the world, some 9.1 million trademark applications filed world, worldwide, and nearly 1 million design applications filed. Interestingly, two-thirds of those applications now originate in Asia. It is a huge shift that we have seen take place in the course of the last 10 years in particular and 20 years more generally. Two thirds of all intellectual property applications are generated from Asia. And besides the driver that is constituted by technology and innovation uh, and their importance to <clears throat> economic growth, we do see that uh, information and communication technologies are also a very much a driver of the use of intellectual property and the increased demand for intellectual property uh, worldwide. <clears throat> so within that context, <clears throat> how does artificial intelligence feature? Uh, and what, if any, are the challenges or problems that are associated with intellectual property policy as a set of policies to encourage innovation on the one hand, and artificial intelligence and its deployment throughout the economy and society. I think we should approach this question uh, with at least two perspectives in mind. Uh, the first perspective is, of course, the traditional role of intellectual property as a means of encouraging investment in innovation and as a means of ensuring that good ideas are transformed into market commercial products. And secondly, I think we need to bear in mind a balance of interests. One needs to have not just an effective intellectual property system, but also a balanced intellectual property. One needs to find the balance between the often competing interests of, on the one hand, producers of intellectual property, and on the other hand, the consumers of intellectual property. And this is something that applies not just within a society, but of course across the world because you have producing countries and largely consuming countries. <clears throat> it's a balance, if you like, between the much needed investment and encouragement to investment in innovation on the one hand, and on the other hand, sharing the social benefit of innovation. This is why we have innovation after all. So we have recently produced a report studying trends in intellectual property and uh, artificial intelligence 
to provide an empirical basis for the policy discussions that are taking place and will take place very much in the future. I think the report uh, tells us or confirms much of what we thought we knew, but it also provides some new insights. Uh, so first of all, what we have found is that since the 1950s, <clears throat> there have been some 340,000 patent applications filed uh, concerning artificial intelligence. There have been over the same period some 1.6 million scientific publications made concerning artificial intelligence. And very interestingly, what we see is from the year about 2003, there is an upsurge, very much an upsurge and growth in scientific publications concerning intellectual property. And from the year 2013, there is an upsurge in patent applications relating to artificial in, in, uh, intelligence. It's a very nice sequencing, if you like, of science followed by its practical application as technology. <clears throat> what we see is that um, artificial, in, amongst the artificial intelligence applications, one third of all patent applications concern machine learning. And the growth rate, the annual growth rate, growth rate is around 20%. It's definitely the field that has been moving. And in particular, the subsets of <coughs> deep learning and neural networks are the fastest growing with 175% growth rate for deep learning and 45% average annual growth rate for neural networks. In functional applications of artificial intelligence, we see that the fastest moving field is robotics and manufacturing methods. Uh, and that growth rate <coughs> is around about 55%. So this, of course, uh, is an insight into fut the future, an in insight into where the applications of technology are going, and we should expect uh, that there will be quite dramatic changes in the distribution of man manufacturing ca capacity around the world as a consequence of the deployment of artificial intelligence techniques in the field of robotics. As far as commercial sectors are concerned, what the report tells us is that there is actually a deep horizontal penetration of artificial intelligence right across all commercial sectors. The most popular are transportation. Uh, we know the self-driving cars, for example, <coughs> drones uh, as another example. And uh, this sector, transportation, accounts for 15% of all artificial intelligence patents. The life sciences and medical sciences accounts for 12%. This is a rather large sector as well. And then, as we would expect, <coughs> personal devices <coughs> and computer-human uh, interaction uh, accounts for about 11%. In terms of the distribution of capacity worldwide, we see China and the US are uh, really way out in front. Japan follows with many, many, uh, uh, much capacity in the field of artificial intelligence, but there is a large gap between those three countries uh, and the rest of the world. Amongst corporate applicants, in the top 20 corporate applicants for uh, intellectual property applications, we see 12 come from Japan, three from the United States of America, and two from China. Uh, and the top patent filers are IBM, Microsoft, Toshiba, and uh, Samsung. Samsung. <clears throat> uh, and finally, let me say, as an insight from the report, what the report shows very much is that companies rather than research institutions, are actually dominating this partic particular field of technology, artificial in intelligence, in terms of patent applications, uh, with companies uh, providing uh, the vast majority of the patent applications. So I think, in summary, what we can see from looking at the data concerning patenting activity in scientific publications in the field of, uh, of artificial intelligence, we can say there is an ex actually an extensive use of the existing intellectual property system for artificial intelligence. That might surprise some because 
uh, the, the existing intellectual property system is, of course, very much a cre creature or a creation of the Industrial Revolution. And one would have paused to think that its applications to the digital revolution and its technologies may not have been quite uh, so widespread. But I think we can say that the old categories have not yet become redundant. Nevertheless, I think there are important challenges, and in particular three, if I may mention very briefly, they require much more detailed analysis, but if I mention them quite briefly. First is, what sort of adjustments to the existing categories are needed? And I think there, two of the salient questions that we see are the question of the author or the creator, uh, with artificial intelligence generating itself answers, uh, how do we ascribe authorship for the purpose of the ownership of property rights, uh, either in the field of technology or in the field of the creative industries? And this is one enduring question. I think a second enduring question we have is the intersection of some policies to encourage the free flow of data on the one hand, which of course feeds the algorithms that uh, supply the artificial intelligence, uh, and on the other hand, the restrictions on the use of data, which is what intellectual property rights actually do. And this, I think, is a huge question and a huge policy question uh, for the future. Let me give you one little example of its application. Artificial intelligence generated music is coming, it has come, uh, but it will soon be on the commercial platforms. Can I take the whole repertoire of, for example, Sony Music and feed it into an algorithm uh, in order to generate artificial intelligence-based uh, music? Or is that an infringement of copyright? This is one of the many questions I think that we will see in this intersection of, of free flow of data on the one hand and restrictions on the other hand. Then a second set of questions I think are around the question of gaps. Yes, the existing intellectual property system is being widely used, but are there any gaps? And I think here um, the questions relate mainly to data. Now, of course, data attracts a confluence of policy questions. There are questions relating to security. There are questions relating to the integrity of data. There are questions relating to competition policy. There are questions relating to privacy or personal protection of personal data. But there are also questions relating to ownership of data. Uh, and if I may make three brief observations on that. First, we see that enterprises are deploying trade secrecy as a policy for the protection of classes of data. And this is uh, widespread. Uh, and it's a very important means of protecting unpublished data which has not yet crystallized into a commercial application or an invention or an innovation, <clears throat> but which has potential value. If you think of the life sciences, enormous quantities of data are being generated, which have a potential value for feeding into algorithms for the development of artificial intelligence in the medical sciences. What sort of protection, if any, applies to those data, which after all cost investment to generate, and they cost expertise in, in asking the right questions. Well, trade secrecy is one thing that is being deployed. A second observation I think is, as I have mentioned, we are going to see a major tension between, in, in the policy level, between the free flow of data and closure. So there are important movements for open science, open data. And there, are all, there is also a competitive need to close data access at a certain point. And this will be one of the major questions, I think, from a policy point of view for governments and for enterprises uh, in the future. Where to draw the line between the pre-competitive and the competitive 
uh, and I think the jury is still very much out on that. And my final observation about that would be <coughs> to say that, of course, the ownership question is very intimately connected with the privacy or protection of personal data question. What a property right that gives you is the right to exclude access. The protection of personal data is a right to control or exclude access to your personal data. Both of them give you the power to sell access, a property right and privacy. So as we see the per protection of personal data unfold uh, around the world in relation to the use made by internet platforms, for example, for, of personal data that is collected from all of us in everything that we do now, this major question will intersect with a property question and give a right, perhaps, uh, for personal data protection, a right that is commercialisable as well uh, in a world in which the future of work is very much uh, a, a question that preoccupies policymakers around the world. Uh, Your Highness, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a final uh, observation is that, of course, I have not addressed the enormous disparities that exist in the world in technological capacity. And one of the questions that will be thrown up by artificial intelligence or is being thrown up by artificial intelligence and intellectual property protection of artificial intelligence which encourages investment in artificial intelligence will be whether this is exacerbating these enormous disparities in technological capacity that exist or whether it has scope to improve uh, the differences, to reduce the differences around the world. Now I think this is a question which of course is much larger than artificial intelligence itself. It relates to the whole of technological capacity and as technological capacity becomes the differentiator in our economies and in our societies, this is certainly uh, a question which needs radical policy attention from all of the policy makers of the world. Your Highness, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a privilege to have this opportunity to speak to you about this sometimes obscure area uh, of policy, but nevertheless a very important and central uh, area of policy making in the contemporary economy. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be at this wonderful summit. Thank you.